Hello and good afternoon. Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the 22nd public lecture of the Accra College of Medicine. The topic of discussion today would be to be a man is not easy. Men's health, perils and perils in the social cultural context. We will begin this session with an opening prayer from Kelvin Inchi. We are praying. Dear Lord and Master Jesus, we thank you so much for this day and what you have brought unto us. We pray, O oh Lord, that this meeting will be a success. We pray that you let your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mr. Kelvin and she. Um, you are welcome once again. At this juncture, I would like to call upon the Vice President, Academic and Students Affairs, Accra College of Medicine, Reverend Professor Adukwe Hesi, to introduce our speaker for today. Mr. Vice President, over to you. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, good morning, and probably also good night, wherever you are, um, in all parts of the globe. Oh, these are beloved Earth. Um, you are welcome to the 22nd um, public lecture of the Accra College of Medicine. Uh, we are talking miles and miles, and today we have an exciting time to do uh, with men, mental health, and the mind. And we are honored uh, to have with us Dr. Johnny Andor Arthur, who is a social and community psychologist and a lecturer at the Department of Psychology, University of Ghana. His main interest is in mental and sexual health of men and young persons. He also has interest in uh, health promotion, social cognition, culture and behavior, community well-being, and I'd like to stress community well-being and qualitative research ethics. He's internationally known as he's got international exposure and partners and is well researched and well written. And so it's a great honor and a particular privilege for me to introduce Dr. Ando Arthur, who is giving us insight into to be a man is not easy. Men's health, perils and perils in a social culture contest. Ladies and gentlemen, hearers and seers, um, please welcome uh, Dr. Johnny Ando Arthur. Thank you. All right, thank you, Prof, for your nice introduction. Um, I want to share my screen with you. Is, uh, the organizers can confirm with me if you can see my entire screen. Yes, we can. You are flipping through. Uh, okay, very good. Yeah. Very good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much again, Prof, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, Mr. Chairman, distinguished uh, guests, dear colleagues and uh, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm highly delighted uh, to be given this opportunity to give a public lecture on the topic, to be a man is not easy, men's health, perils and pearls in a sociocultural context. Uh, let me be quick to admit that the organizers of this public lecture gave me the opportunity to choose a topic that will sit in my research and practice. And so this chosen topic came in handy because I knew it will arrest curious minds and possibly also caught public attention to an action on a silent and yet a serious problem of high mortality and mobility among men globally and in Ghana. After all, who in this lecture has not heard about a popular saying, to be a man is not easy before, and it's many renditions in different Ghanaian languages. 
we see this uh, saying, I mean, embossed boldly on vehicles to inspire men in the drudgery of commercial transport business. We see the saying emblazoned on dilapidated walls as a constant reminder to young males aspiring to be men. We see the saying even themed in cartoons to get to get it first turned into the fertile minds of children. In fact, sometimes we also appropriate this to remind women that some things are for men only, and that it takes a lot to become a man. Indeed, this saying is also sung in popular music as a veiled cry of men, just to ventilate the stresses men go through in the society. And we are all, I mean, some of us are still, you know, very familiar with Amachi Dedi's uh, song, To Be a Man, no, Nawao. Yeah. Again, this saying is also analyzed, even in academic discourses, to uncover its gendered ramifications. I dare say that the saying to be a man is not easy, and it is heavily loaded. It has both manifest and much deeper latent meanings which together have several implications, including men's health and well-being. All right, so what is my task in this public lecture? First, my task is to help unpack, unpack this popular and yet taken for granted assume to be a man is not easy. And again, to highlight its connections to men's health generally and the specific problem of suicide in men. To highlight men's health generally, and also to highlight a specific problem of suicide in men. One may ask, what is a psychologist doing in a public lecture in Ghana's leading private medical school on a topic that is Janus feast? That is a topic with sociological and medical facets. In answering this question, I will take solace in the famous WHO definition of health. What is it? It says state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. So at least the definition of health, according to WHO, emphasizes holistic health, where that requires effort at multi-layered levels and from multi-stakeholder perspectives, including that of psychologists. So let me say that as a psychologist, I have not get crushed at all in this lecture. I belong here some, as some will say in Ghana. <laughs> but more importantly, Mr. Chairman, let me also add that it took serendipity for me to enter and work in the specific area of men's health in general and men's mental health, to be more specific. This occurred during my PhD research work into suicides in Ghana. Even though I was gender blind throughout the conceptualization of my PhD research at the proposal stage, I came out of the PhD being consciously gender biased in my research on suicides. So as you can see from my uh, slides, <laughs> I began from a gender blind PhD proposal titled, quote, Meanings of Suicide in Ghana, a Qualitative Psychological Autopsy Study. But I ended up, after four years, with a PAD that was titled, quote, It is a man's world, exploring the cultural meanings of suicide among men in Ghana. Mr. Chairman, I, I will return to the Yemen issue of suicide among men later. But before that, I want to underscore the fact that the world faces a problem of rising male mortality and, and, and morbidity. And the certain is that most of these deaths are preventable. In fact, prior to this lecture, I did a rapid survey in my own church and some other churches. And I found out that at any point in time, there are more widows compared to widowers. So in effect, a lot more men die and leave their wives as widows. And for data from extant literature also suggests that life expectancy is generally 
low for males across several disease and illness categories. Let, let, let's have a quick look at a few from the WHO data that I chanced on. So several conditions contribute to the differences in life expectancy between men and women. If a men's reduced life expectancy compared with women, it's not due to a single or a small number of causes. Of the leading 40 causes of death, 33 causes contribute more to reduced life expectancy in men than in women, as you can see. The cause of death that most contribute to a lower life expectancy for men than women are ischemic or heart diseases, road accidents or road uh, injuries, lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, stroke, cirrhosis of the liver, tuberculosis, prostate cancer, interpersonal violence. You can see from um, uh, the, the data here that only breast cancer, maternal conditions, and cervical cancer are the causes of death that have the strongest effect in lowering female global life expectancy in comparison with male global life expectancy. So men are dying more than women. All right. In fact, let us just even look at coronavirus. Coronavirus came, and although the number of male coronavirus cases was somewhat similar to the number of female cases globally, Men have had twice the risk of death from COVID. In fact, the bulk of evidence point towards gender variance in the prevalence, in severity, in clinical outcomes, and other characteristics of COVID-19. For example, data from 1,000 patients from China revealed that the severity of and death rate from COVID was significantly higher in males than in females. In another study, males were significantly more likely to be hospitalized, transferred to the intensive care unit, received vasopressor support, and endotracheal intubation. In fact, I had to even um, uh, find data in Ghana, and I went to Ghana East, Ghana East Municipal uh, Hospital. I mean, where virtually I mean, we, I mean, dedicated that facility for you know managing of COVID and. This is the data I got. So you could see that from March to December, in terms of admissions, 929 were admitted compared to 638. From January to June 2021, 932 males admitted compared to 583. It was in July to December 2021 where we had women leading with 159 as against 154. From January up to June this year, Admissions have been 21 males and then 16 what, uh, females. So, you know, we have had 2,036 male admissions compared to 1,396 female admissions. But in terms of death, mortality, from March to December 2020, 12 men died as against what? Uh, 10 men died as against two females. 50 men died as against 39 died. Men died as against 16 from January to June 2021. 30 men died as against 31 females from July to December 2021. And of course, January toward June, we had four men dying as against two. So in all, men, you know, total mortality for on men in that facility was 61 compared with 51. So men again are uh, leading the charts. Let's look at um, communicable diseases. In fact, most epidemiological studies have shown that being a man is a risk factor for infectious diseases. Hence, women have been seen to exhibit a higher ability to recognize pathogens. They also are able to mobilize more in innate immune cells and mount stronger adaptive immune response than men. In terms of non-communicable diseases, in fact, there are four main risk factors for both men and women, and these are unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, tobacco use, and harmful use of alcohol. You and I will agree with me that men have been engaging in most of these unhealthy you know, lifestyles more than women, and therefore the risk that it might pose for men may be higher than for women. I want us to just stray into the area of sexual and reproductive health problems. 
uh, it, it, it may be taken for granted that there appears not to be so much of what sexual and reproductive health problems in Ghana because you don't get admissions for such cases for men. Mr. Chairman, given the pro-natal society we live in, it appears that the most recreative specialization in medical practice in Ghana is obstetrics and then gynecology. I, I do not have the actual data, but anecdotal evidence suggests there are more male doctors attending to female sexual and reproductive health matters than male doctors attending to male sexual and reproductive health problems. The reason is not far-fetched. The client base for female sexual and reproductive health issues is huge, making it a profitable venture. To many men, sexual and reproductive health problems are very private matters that require men to handle it in their own way. Even men who do see health professionals on such matters actually do so only when their problems get out of hand. This is indeed a real problem. Let's look at risky behaviors. Males dominate in almost all the risky behaviors you can think of that compromise health and well-being. In fact, information from the MTTU division and the, the Dovsu division of Ghana Police shows overrepresentation of male corporates in road traffic accidents and domestic violence. As of this morning, as of this morning, I, I checked, you know, the image statistics at Nsawo Medium Security Prison, and it stood at 3,060 men who are incarcerated, as against only 70 females. In fact, for 2021 alone, males stopped first degree felonies, such as murder. And in 2021, defilement, defilement was the most common crime for which males were convicted. What about substance use? Men are overrepresented in substance use. In fact, the United Nations uh, Office of Drug and Crimes uh, 2022 report highlights continuing gender gap in illicit drug use with men in the majority. Men are overrepresented, even in alcohol use and misuse as well, as well as the associated problems such as drug dependency. So the question is, why men? Why do we have low life expectancy and high prevalence of problem behaviors in men? Explanation may, have, may come from biological sources as well as environmental sources. For the biological for, for forces, there's the fact of the Y chromosome. The role of the Y chromosomes in sex determination is so clear, as we know. In fact, the sex we are all assigned at birth depends on largely a genetic flip of the coin X or Y. Two S chromosomes, and then one becomes one develops an ovary, an X, and then Y, and then another one develops what? Testis. But there is this gene, the SRY gene, that is the sex determining region of the Y, which is located at the distal region of the short arm of the Y chromosome. This is necessary for sex determination in mammals. The SRY, the SRY uh, uh, gene initiates the cascade of steps necessary to form a testis from an undifferentiated gonad. So basically, we develop as males from an undifferentiated gonad, thanks to the SRY gene on the Y. Otherwise, we are all females by default, I think. So maybe this biological fact may lend some credence to the saying that to be a man is not easy. Something must happen. SRY gene must do something for one to switch from the default into becoming a male. But geneticists are also giving us some facts. Of course, there are some debates. According to the many generations ago, the Y chromosome was large and contained as many genes as the X chromosomes. But now it is a fraction of its past size and contains fewer than 80 functional genes. According to them, the X chromosome is fine because in females, it gets to recombine with the other X. But the Y never gets to recombine over almost its entire length. And the shutting down that recombination has left the Y vulnerable. The shutting down has left the Y chromosome so vulnerable to all these de degenerative forces. So this proposition has led to debates and concerns over the years regarding the Y chromosomes, eventually its eventual destiny, and possibly demise of men in the future. Of course, there are raging debates in this area. But I don't know those of us who are Christians. 
Prophet Isaiah was he aware of this biological fact when he prophesied in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1, that a day is coming when seven women will want what? To be married by one man. And all they would want to say is that, please, we have our own food, we have our own house, we, we, we can provide everything for ourselves. All we need to do, we need to do is just marry us. It's just put your name on us. The prophet Isaiah see this biological fact when he prophesied that time is coming where we will have disproportionate number of males and females for which seven males will go for one male. So seven females will go for one, one male. There's also the issue of testosterone. Male hormone testosterone has been linked to decrease in the immune system and risk of cardiovascular disease as males age. This hormone is also linked to risky behaviors such as smoking, drinking, and unhealthy eating habits. Self harm and eventual suicide. Mr. Chairman, now with the mention of suicide, let me switch to my main research area to emphasize how biological and social cultural factors conspire to create what has been called a silent epidemic of male suicides. Yes, suicide is a complex behavior that is widely regarded as a significant public health issue across the globe. It occurs at a juncture of multiple factors, psychiatric, psychological, biological, social, cultural, economic, and existential, among others. In fact, males feature prominently in all suicide statistics. And this has led some leading researchers in, this, in, the, in the area to describe suicide in men as a silent epidemic. Why is it a silent epidemic? Why is it silent? It is silent because there is no public awareness regarding the magnitude of the problem. Again, there's also little research to help explain the problem of male suicides, meaning that we have less effective intervention and prevention efforts towards suicides. Why is it called epidemic? Because of its high incidence. In fact, suicide is a major contributor to men's mortality between the ages of 15 and 44 years. Suicide is among the top three sources of what? Men's mortality. And across all countries reporting data to WHO, except China and then India. Male suicide is three to about 7.5 times that of women. Yeah, so WHO commissioned, you know, a, a, a group uh, to update uh, on the prevalence of suicide generally. That is a, uh, Nagavi et al. Yes, and you realize that if you see my uh, slide, Almost everywhere, except in the issues in the China and India, almost everywhere, males predominate. When it comes to Africa, you can see that the gender gap is really so wide in the eastern sub-Saharan Africa and the southern sub-Saharan Africa. So it means that many more men in these areas are killing themselves compared to females. Yeah, so globally, you can see that the gender gap between male and female society is really huge especially in the central Europe, it is really huge. So for, for these places, you may have, you know, seven males killing themselves to one females. And indeed, Lithuania, Russia, Luxembourg come up as countries where we are ha having higher male suicides in the world. When it comes to the issue of suicide attempts, actually, WHO does not routinely collect data on suicide attempts. So data has basically been coming from national and regional rates of suicide attempts, from self-reports, and from medical records. And all this is because there are four vital registration and data collection systems for uh, suicide attempts. But globally, generally, women are more likely than men to engage in non-fatal suicidal behavior. That is a suicide attempt. Females have been noted to predominate in that. Mr. Chairman, given that a single most important predator for suicide is what? Is suicide attempts. Indeed, suicide attempts is a single most important risk factor for suicides. But females actually dominate suicide attempts. And so one would have expected that if females are dominating suicide attempts, then obviously they should be seen to be what? To be killing themselves more than men. But indeed, that is not what the literature is showing. That's what we call gender paradox in suicidal behaviors. The observation that rates of suicide attempts are high for females 
across many countries. Yet, mortality from suicide is low in, 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 in females, but high among males is what we have come to know as gender paradox. In fact, people have explained the gender paradox from different perspectives. Okay, one is the lethality theory. Here, the argument goes that males are more likely than females to use more immediately lethal methods, such as gunshots, hanging, jumping from the heights, drowning, uh, jumping in front of speed train, uh, and then females are more likely to ingest poisons or overdose. There was this theory that also says what we call recall bias theory. It says that gender paradox is an artifact of gender differences in reporting. So women give more accurate account of their health history than men. So they are assumed to be more willing to report suicidal behaviors and get the help for it. Again, it is also seen that there is also what we call differential rate of alcohol and then depression. Women have higher incidence and prevalence of depression and higher rate of recurrent episodes and higher treatment rates than do men. Men, on the other hand, have higher rates of alcoholism and then alcohol abuse. So in effect, men may be as suicidal as men, but successful treatment of depression, you know, attenuates its severity and prevents suicide. Then of course, there's also the socialization theory. Here, we are saying that there are gender differences in culturally acceptable self-destructive behaviors. So you go to some cultures, suicide is viewed as a masculine behavior, as are alcohol abuse and illegal substance abuse. And then suicide attempts is also seen more as a feminine behavior. So cultures have gender scripts for the choice of suicide and then suicide attempts. But is the gender paradox universal? Certainly no, as I said. In China and in India, females kill themselves more than males. You come to Ghana, research has also found that males actually dominate in both fatal and non-fatal suicide. Males dominate in both suicide and suicide attempts. So it means that the gender paradox is not what universal, meaning there are some sociocultural you know, reasons behind you know, these differences. So research has been done, and a, and a lot of research has also what, have also you know, uh, uh, confirmed that indeed males you know, engage in suicide attempts and then suicide more than females. The gentlemen, throughout the research we have done so far on men's health and men's suicide, let me say that uh, that I'll say there are two groups of men who take their lives. There are two groups of men who take their lives. We have the, uh, the uh, those uh, those men who are living with severe mental illnesses, and so for them, suicide is usually impulsive. It is less agentic, and suicide can be construed more or less as a consequence of mental illness. They may be having underlying mental illness, and suicide may come out as a consequence of it. And so you may have people who are having auditory and visual hallucinations, hearing voices telling themselves what to throw themselves in front of a car, you know, to just stab themselves, you know, hearing or seeing people, you know, beckoning them to, to jump from a height. These may be people who may be living with what? Mental illnesses. But there are also a group of men who are defined by a set of social facts. That means they have lost their ties to society, work, family, and friends. In other words, they have come adrift in their own lives. And so for them, suicide is a reason option. And they consciously choose it as a way of solving a problem. So explanation for you know, suicide among these two groups of men, again, have come from these you know, uh, perspectives, biological, neurochemical, and then environmental. What about biological? It is suggested that the testosterone, which is linked to impulsivity and aggression, are about 10 times more in males than in females. So the high propensity for males to engage in risky behaviors, including aggression towards others and to themselves, is attributed to high testosterone levels in males. There is also the neurochemical argument. A most consistent neurobiological abnormality implicated in suicide is that of serotonin. Abnormalities in the number of serotogenic neurons, serotonin transportation, receptor binding, and then serotonin levels in key brain areas have all been linked with suicide by far. 
the environmental factors, that is the social cultural factors, have been so dominant in its explanation for the high rate of suicide in men. The social cultural view, however, connects high male suicide mortality to gender stereotypes and wrong socialization. The prevailing view, according to this perspective, is that males are socialized to live according to what society expects of men. Ironically, Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, police and students, the very societal expectation that seemingly pushes males to become men also presents risks for suicide in men, in some men who may find it difficult to meet such expectations. So, some have said, we claim a place in the gender order, or we respond to the place we have been given by the way we conduct ourselves in everyday life. At this juncture, it is important to differentiate between sex and gender, because we often use them interchangeably, but there are significant differences between them. Sex refers to the biological characteristics that make human beings male or female, while gender is associated with the masculine or feminine characteristics that society encourages in males and females. So socialization into gender is influenced by significant others such as our parents, our peers, our media, advertising, teachers, societal institutions, schools, universities, church, all these institutions really, you know, uh, socialize us into one gender or the other. Indeed, psychological research suggests that most people combine masculine and feminine traits in varying blinds. So gender is therefore not a static and polarized concept. And indeed, men may have a range of traits. The ones he will express will be affected by the context he's in. So gender can change over time. Gender can vary between cultures. Being a man can be acquired, it can be conferred, and can be lost. Gender behavior depends on the context. And so when you go to some countries like India, it is a female who have to identify a man and then do the necessary what, uh, uh, right, and then marry the man, has to pay the bride price. But you come to what, our context, it is opposite. Males will have to identify a woman, pay the bride price, and marry. So, you know, every society has its own prescription as to who a man is and how a man or a woman should what should behave. So, like I said, we all might have different traits. Men might have different traits. The ones, the traits he will express will be affected by the context he's in. For example, in the hospital, men often feel they have to rein in their emotions when you are giving them injections. You see clearly that they, they will wish to verbalize a certain distress, pain, but because of societal you know, injunctions, they cannot. So you could see clearly from their faces, they are reining in that emotion. But why is it that these males, when they find themselves on the pitch, on the football pitch, you know, during a match, that really matters a lot. They lose maybe the final match and lose the trophy. You see them cry like they are babies. So truly, it is not an issue of males not having emotions. We have emotions, but society appears to be defining where and when emotions must be what must be expressed verbally or must be expressed openly or must be expressed in private. So every culture has its own norms on who is a man. So for the Western world, a man should strive for power. A man must be independent. A man must be in control. A man must be invulnerable. Don't feel pain. Don't express pain. And research has found out that these scripts really make men particularly vulnerable to negative impact of unemployment and marital breakdown. So social expectations and definitions of masculinity could be held damaging, even to the point of what propelling men towards suicidal behavior. Let's come to Ghana. In Ghana, who is a man? A man, according to um, a research that has been done by anthropologists, a man must be the one who exercises authority over women and junior men. A man must accumulate wealth. A man must exhibit courage and bravery in the face of adversity. And so we have local, you know, uh, sayings, okay, that all encapsulates this social expectation that men must be daring and demonstrate fortitude and invincibility. So, for instance, we have what we call, we have this saying that, or better man, a man doesn't cry. Or better man, a man doesn't fear death. Or better man, you know, it's a real man who takes better medicine. Or better man, or general, so well, it's a man who doesn't breathe whenever he, he steps in water. 
So all these local scripts appear to give a certain, you know, uh, tacit uh, support to the fact that as a man, you need to ring in your emotion. You need to be, be, be to restrict your emotions. You need to also engage in certain behaviors. But we see that men in their strive toward to really meet all these norms, some of them sometimes can be hard damaging to the point of even pushing them toward to suicide. So again, research has been done in Ghana to you know, show that most suicides in Ghana, for instance, you know, for as far as males are concerned, the motive may be to avoid shame, okay, to avoid family dispute. It is maybe due to job loss or financial problem. There are some cases of mental illness. Again, there's also issue of suspected wife and then girlfriend having an affair with another person. That is infidelity, sexual impotence. These have been found in research as key reasons that really push men along that line of wanting to kill themselves. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, I have also done my studies on suicide among men in Ghana, and truly, I found that you know uh, suicide basically was connected to experiences of shame. Okay, you know that was related to loss of economic control, breach of patriarchal norms, and threat to sexual competence. We had men who had lost their jobs, and therefore they could not go, they could not come, as we say in Ghana. For some of them, females or their wives have taken over that responsibility of what providing, and it wasn't easy for some men. Okay, so they had roles had reversed, roles had reversed. So a man who is supposed to provide, it was women who were, supposed, were providing, and it created a lot of distresses for them. So let me just read uh, an extract from one. Uh, um, uh, interview I had with a wife whose husband killed himself. I could. So the wife said, I go for used clothing and sell. Sometimes my distributors get some and sometimes they don't, they don't get. So I became the man and at the same time the woman in the house. I'm a hardworking woman and I cannot lazy about in the house when I have kids. Through all that, he was not courageous like I was. Because when an issue came up, he would be trembling. So here, this woman sees a breach of masculinity. He was expecting a man to have been providing. He was expecting a man to have shown courage in times of trouble. But this is not what she saw about the man. So when a man lives in a situation like this and he's seen as not being a man, you and I can guess really what he may be going through. A different spouse also said, when a man lost his job and life was becoming so difficult, quote, he surprisingly asked me to befriend someone on social media and pretend I was not married. This social media friend was interested in me and started sending me some money, which I used to take care of him. Another person also said, a woman, I realized my husband was not having money on him, so I gave him Henry Ghana cities as pocket money. It was so difficult because he always said that he didn't like a woman's money, so he would not want to take money from me. So if you look at the, the last extract that I've just read, you can see that role reversal, where the men were not able to provide and the women were provide, it had a paradoxical effect. On one hand, it helped the men to survive, but on the other hand, it also led to dependency, which some of the men interpreted as what it, it, it has interpreted as having tainted their masculinity. So yes, men were not having work; they were not working. Some of them were having what their wives providing for them, but they were actually interpreting it as what as a, a loss of masculinity, as a damage to what to their masculinity. And for that reason, some of them came under distress and eventually took their lives. But I want to also uh, touch on the issue of sexual competence and how it has also influenced some suicides in Ghana. Here again, it was an issue of a man who killed himself. He had a problem as prostate cancer, and I think he was prepared for a uh, surgery at Kolebu. The man kept on you know, telling the brothers that he wouldn't go through the surgery. He wouldn't do it because uh, he feared that when he goes through the surgery, he may not be able to, order to have sex again. As to whether it was true or it was not true, we couldn't determine. But we were told that on the eve of the surgery, the man just left the hospital and then just behind the ward went and hung himself. So one of the brothers said, quote, he told me point blank that he was scared, so he didn't go there to the Kolebu. He didn't want to go back because he thought he could find other treatment elsewhere without necessarily going through the surgery. Now, that's what the father of that deceased said. My suspicion is based on the fear of the surgery and its outcomes. Maybe he thought he might not be able to perform his manly duties with the woman. I mean, he was a man. So probably he thought after the surgery, it would take a long time for him to go near a woman. Or perhaps the doctors might have told him that the surgery might destroy his manhood. 
We also came across cases of childlessness where a man have lived without children and apparently uh, it had been diagnosed that the problem was coming from the men. And for some of them, their wives were more like taunting them. The wives were taunting them. Why are you not, are you not, are you not impregnating me and all that? So some of them really came under intense pressure from society and from their own spouses and eventually took their lives. They couldn't bear the disease. I also found connection between substance use and suicide among men. And we realized that for some men, when they find themselves in all these distresses, they use the substance use more or less as a self-medication. So if I could read some of the quotes, um, for instance, he was not drinking alcohol previously, but he later began drinking alcohol. That is what a brother told us about the brother who killed himself. Another also said he started picking some strange behaviors, including drinking, just after the mother died. This was a man who was not what working, was depending on the mother, and the mother died, and therefore thought that he has had an existential you know, uh, loss, and therefore he took to drinking. In fact, uh, one also told us that when the, the body of the husband was sent to, uh, to the hospital for an autopsy, it was revealed that he had already taken in poison. And so it seemed when he was suffering from the effect of the poison, he hung himself. He was a tall person and they found that the nature of the hanging should not have killed him. So it was the effect of the poison that rather killed him. He mixed the poison with the alcohol and took it. So the conclusion for my study basically was that for the men that I studied, suicide was used to escape shame due to the inability of what we termed as 3P masculinity norms, providing materially performing sexually and then producing children. So in the context of their situation, majority of the men, nine, they use substances. But we also realized that substances, you know, uh, had a shifting function during the suicidal process. So uh, the men use it initially more or less to cope as a self medication to regulate their emotions associated with underlying disturbances. But some also use substances as a way of communicating. So it was a metaphor to communicate to society that I'm having a problem, but I cannot speak about it. And so when you have men who do not drink and suddenly they are drinking, index drinking, it is no longer something we should see as a social behavior. It is something that could also be a sign that somebody is going through an underlying issue, but do not have the social competence or to communicate. And again, we also found that substances, including alcohol, were actually used as a means for the suicides. Some of them drank alcohol before the poison, more or less, to numb okay, the pain that they would go through it. It is not easy to cut, cut yourself, let alone stabbing. And so you would necessarily drink alcohol more or less to numb the senses to be able to accomplish that. So this was again what we found. But Mr. Chairman, before I conclude, I think it's important that we put all this in, in a broader perspective, men and men's health. You see, studies continue to see that men conceptualize health around different themes, performance orientation. As far as they are able to work and carry out their normal task, they are healthy. Fitness orientation. They stand in front of mirror. They see themselves as having what six pack, four packs, or what have you. You know, muscles, everything standing. They think they are healthy. There's also what they call feeling state orientation. The general feeling of well being linked with emotional health. When they feel everything is fine, they think they are healthy. Meanwhile, there could be some problems, emotional problems. Then again, symptom free. As long as men do not see any symptom, for them, there is no what illness. So prevailing view of health for most men is related to the ability of work, ability to work. So as long as work can be done, no matter the situation a man finds himself, he's healthy. But this is wrong. And so work, we have found that work constitutes a major, you know, a, a very key concept in the life of men. Life is just of men. You know, work allows men to construct masculinity in two areas, in occupation, as to go to work, you take your bag every day, you go and come. That gives you a time structure. You build a relationship, you know, at work. You form, you know, uh, ties and also make meaning in life. Again, work also helps men to, to, I mean, get income. Of course, you need income to, to be able to meet certain needs. And so work, therefore, helps men to reproduce patriarchal domestic structure. If you're a man and you have money, then it means you really can meet your obligations as a man. But we find that for most suicide, it is the tension between these areas of occupation and then patriarchal domestic structure, which are implicated in the suicidal behaviors whenever men lose their work. Mr. Chairman, we need to look at the issue of male depression. 
help seeking and suicide. Now, why is it that depression is an important risk factor for suicide? And females dominate in, in, in depression, yet males kill themselves more than females. It is something that we need to think of as doctors and as doctors in training. Epidemiological research shows that incidence of unipolar depression in men is half that of women. But male depression is often overlooked and not recognized for what it is. And this has one of the reasons. One, men are reluctant to acknowledge depressive symptoms due to aspect of male socialization. So a man should not cry, and therefore he's going through a lot, he's going through distress, he cannot even verbalize. Two, men experience depression in a specific way with different symptoms. So if you go typically, okay, to use the, 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 the diagnostic criteria to, what, to assess depression in males, you may not find it. Because men will externalize symptoms of depression in anger, in alcohol misuse, in risk taking. And you know, in the typical, you know, internalized symptoms of sadness, sorrow, you know, you will not have men usually, you know, display this as symptoms of what? Depression. So standard operational criteria for depression, which typically emphasize internalizing symptoms such as sadness and worry, are not valid in male populations. And so people have even suggested that we need to maybe come up with what? With maybe a more modified, you know, uh, uh, diagnostic criteria that could really be able to, to ascertain, you know, men's depression, which are expressed you no know, more externally. Again, negative coping styles also due to the tendency of some men to adhere strict uh, to rigid men, uh, masculinity is also one of the things that is making men sometimes unable, okay, to show or to express worries. Indeed, research has been found, has been done to show that men who strongly identify as self-reliant they have 34% greater odds of reporting thoughts of suicide. They feel like I'm self-reliant. I don't need the help from anywhere. These men have the odds, 34% greater odds of reporting suicides. Indeed, I have just done a quick survey here at the University of Ghana, you know, among male students. And 56% of University of Ghana male students answered that they will not seek professional help for sexual behaviors. For them, it is it, it, it is so um, it, 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 it is so embarrassing to just open up, okay, about sexual you know problem. It is something that you, if you say it, people would now see you as a less of a man. These are university students. So even though fifty seven percent said they will not talk, see professional help, the good news is that at least ninety five percent did not consider suicide as an option. So at least that tells us that suicide is not something that is worth considering. But again, there's still a problem if we have this huge percentage of male students who feel they do not need to want to see a professional. But there's an irony of men's emotional restricti restrictiveness. Men restrict emotions, but it, it is an irony. One, because men are biologically the most vulnerable of the two sexes, as I have shown through the evidence, Y chromosomes and all that, we have shown. The very fact of what? Maleness. The very fact of the Y chromosome and the very fact of the evolution of Y chromosome tells us that, in fact, males, we are vulnerable. And indeed, research by developmental psychologists also let you know, let you know that, you know, male, uh, uh, about 50, more than 50% of what of miscarriages basically are males. So there's something biologically, you know, uh, uh, important that we need to look at. So males are biologically vulnerable. Whereas the S, S chromosomes enhance female survival chances, males with one X in the SY chromosomes means that there's less you know, uh, survival chances and therefore we are at risk. The male fetus is at greater risk of death or damage from almost all obstetric catastrophes that can happen before birth. Pre perinatal brain damage, more males. Cerebral palsy, more males. Gen congenital deformities of the genitalia and limbs, more males. Premature birth, more males, and still birth, they are all common in, in boys. By the time a boy is born, he is on average, developmentally, some weeks behind his sister. So a newborn girl is the physiological equivalent of a four to six week old boy. That is what developmental, developmentalists are telling us. So the problem of the morning man, Mr. Chairman, if I say that to be a man is not easy, the problem of the modern man is that there is addition of social insult to man's biological injuries. So my males have what biological vulnerabilities, but society also appears to be placing so much demands and obligations on males such that males do not even have what 
the opportunity more or less to even seek or verbalize, to open up and discuss and to share their pains and their worries. This is the problem of the modern man. If I come, keep on mentioning the issue of male, male, man, 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 the good thing is that we are not a monolithic group. There are some males who are actually what? Redefining masculinity and now opening up. I mean, sharing their issues, crying. But there are some males who rigidly still, you know, adhere to, you know, that traditional notion of being a man. Hold it. Don't share it. Open. And indeed, sometimes society will not even hear the stories behind male, male's uh, worries. They wouldn't want to, want to hear. You have a typical male and a typical female in marriage who are going through crisis. Society is more likely to listen to the male, female, but not listen to the man. And I cannot tell you, Mr. Chairman, that a lot of men are going through crisis. They find it difficult to even open up and share with anyone. So what then constrains men from opening up? We need what? To re-engineer our norms and values when it comes to who a male is and who a female is. So the very societal expectation of being a man is a very stressor that is causing a lot of pain to some men who are already biologically vulnerable. Indeed, there's a paper I'm working on. Uh, it's currently in, on the review, and I have titled it The Paradox of Interdependency. The Paradox of Interdependency. We expect males to provide. We expect males to, to, to help, to, to, to take care of what? Family members. But when males have troubles, when males lose their job, when males you know, go through adversities, we refuse to come back, come to their aid, and we leave them to battle it alone. That is what is happening. And so I'm articulating that in a paper that I have sent, which is current on the review. So society does not validate open expression of men's distresses, and we need to change that. So Mr. Chairman, not only are men less likely to seek help, they really need help. They really seek help, but they also need a different kind of help. And that is why as medical doctors and doctors in training, we need to, to understand these facts and know how we also reach out to help males. And I'll give you a few recommendations on what we can do more or less to promote health seeking among males. So by way of implication and recommendation on all that I've said, we need education to increase understanding of men's mental health and to promote empathy towards men undergoing adversities. Mr. Chairman, we are very much aware of that typical hierarchical relationship between doctors and patients. This morning, when I was coming to the office, you know, I had Ghana Medical Association. I think they were on uh, the secretary was on uh, Joy FM, more or less promoting their lecture coming on somewhere in who. And I like the topic, you know, doctor patient relationship, you know, something like that. And I think that they have all found the need to redefine doctor patient relationship, especially when you engage men. When a man comes to sit in front of you and you just talk, you just talk, you don't even want the man to also talk. You always want to just say whatever you want to say. The man virtually has no voice. Oftentimes, they go and they don't come back again. Sometimes, in fact, men will also want to communicate certain things okay, to you, but depending on your posturing as a doctor, they will not even open up. And you can see, I mean, from what I have done so far and the work I have done, males sometimes also typically want to, to open up to females whenever they have what, emotional problems. They prefer opening up to females, female doctors, than even male doctors. But when it comes to sexual reproductive and sexual health problems, they rather prefer to, to open up to what? To male doctors. So sometimes we can also reconfigure the health system in such a way that when males come and we can, I know the issue of uh, doctor patient ratio in Ghana, we can, we can suggest. Based on your condition, do you want a male doctor to attend to you or a female doctor to attend to you? I know that it might, can be a luxury in Ghana looking at that situation, but can we get there so that we can give the male the chance to open up? So again, we also need to incorporate social, economic, cultural factors into men's health, well-being and suicide prevention. When they come to you at the consulting rooms, please, it's not only just medical issues they are presenting. They are presenting a whole, you know, a uh, 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 bouquet of problems that has just manifested physically. And so it's important that oftentimes we just engage them. Possibly we can even get psychologists, okay, to also come into that therapeutic arrangement for them to also help, you know, uh, uncover what are the underlying issues. Because if you don't do that, you can treat the physical aspect, but they'll go back with the social and economic issues and emotional issues. Then again, we also need to have a dualistic focus on substance use and suicide prevention. When we are helping people out of substance use, 
We must also know its link with suicide. There could also be underlying suicide. There can be co-mobility between substances and suicide. And therefore, we just don't treat the substance use and then leave the suicide unattended to. We need to also what, to uh, uh, screen for suicide, you know, uh, 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 suicidal thought and suicide. And indeed, I have had, you know, patients who have just been discharged from, you know, uh, the psychiatric centers and went ahead to kill themselves. You know, they went and reported substance use. They were treated, they were discharged, they go home, and within the few days, they kill themselves. We need to also what, have that dual focus and sometimes follow them up when they get back home after this child. Of course, as a society, we need to also counter the narrow definition of masculinity. Masculinity is not just about providing, it's not just about what, performing sexually or procreating children. Masculinity must be redefined, okay, to incorporate a lot of things, including being a good father, including opening up, including sharing, including engaging in volunteerism. If you lose your job, that is not the end of life. You can still engage in something. So we need to, what, as a society, counter this narrow definition of masculinity that is seen in, in terms of performance, sexual performance in terms of children production in, in, ter in terms of provision of what material needs. This will help us to uh, counter unhealthy cultural scripts that are suicidogenic. The issue of Berman, uh, Bermadis, and Ferreni, and said the phenomenon, it is not, it is really very toxic and we must counter them as a society. Then again, we need to also create safe therapeutic arenas where men can disclose problems. Please, when the men came, come to you at the consulting room, Make sure that at least the place is so secured that they can open up. Your facial expression, the way you relate to them, your sitting position, all can influence, okay, the therapeutic arrangements and how they can open up to receive the help. Okay, men have issues when it comes to shame, ego. We know the issue of ego, and so when men are going through shame, sometimes the problems they are going through may have an underlying issue of shame. And therefore, it's important that we create that safe therapeutic arena where they can open up and then share with us the source of their shames. So we can also have gender, look at the issue of gender in terms of therapy that we give them. A male can come and look at the situation and from whatever he prefers, you can give the person maybe a female doctor, a female psychologist, psychologist or psychiatrist to attend to, or male psychiatrist or doctor to attend to, depending on their choice. We can get there. I know, of course, that it may be difficult looking at our doctor-patient ratio. Then of course, let us also meet men where they are. We, if you sit down in a consulting room and always expecting the men to come and tell us their issues, they will not come. Sometimes let us use what others will call male cafes, where men can be found. Men can be found, you know, at a place where they play them. Men can be found in the sports stadium. In the various churches, we have men's fellowship, where men typically can be found. That is where when you go to them with what, issues concerning their sexual reproductive health, they are more likely to open up and then tell you what they are going through. Again, we also need to combine pharmacological and psychosocial with practical help. Sometimes all men may need is just what a hug, it's just a handshake. Sometimes it just may need even providing a certain legal advice or connecting a man to some sort of help. It may not necessarily be a physical problem the person is presenting to you. Uh -huh. So oftentimes most of these issues are uh, somatized and it may have a real uh, economic or cultural or social, you know, underpinnings, which we could, you know, deal with. So we just need to identify this and offer the practical help to them. Of course, as a nation, we also need to improve the welfare scheme. When men lose their job, we must, as a nation, do so a lot of things to help, to help them because they are taking care of children, they're taking care of families, they're taking care of what? Uh, they are uh, parents who are alive and all that. So it, it's a burden. It's a burden. And then again, we also need to help men with problem solving skills. When men actually go to adversity, some of them don't know how to solve problems. And so they always go for easy, you know, strategies, drug abuse, you know, alcohol abuse. Okay. These are really not adaptive or functional problem solving what strategies. They are dysfunctional. So we need to open up and help them. Sometimes you can just offer an advice in the consulting room, or you can connect some of these people to or to. Psycho psychologists or occupational therapists, just to help them see how best they can also what, build their problem solving skills. And of course, let us encourage men to engage more in voluntary actions and involve fathering. If men are at home taking care of their children, they are removing their diapers, they are taking care of their wives who are pregnant, taking their, their wives what, to the antenatal, they go to the labor room to see their wife deliver, all these can help them to challenge their own assumptions about who they are. And some of us really have had that opportunity and we then saw the need for us to be more, you know, fathering than we have ever been. It's important. 
Then, of course, let us also create support systems for older men and men in chronic and then sexual reproductive health issues. For men who are in chronic issues, such as diabetes and all that, they see themselves as a burden on their family. And so for them, dying will rather benefit the survivors. And so they will prefer to kill themselves and go so that, you know, their survive, young surviving, you know, uh, dependent will not bear the brunt of their sickness. So let us also find support systems for them. I don't know, public education is important. We must open up, talk about these issues. People have the impression that when you talk about suicide, you talk about these things, you're rather fostering that idea in them. No, research shows that the more we talk about it, the more people relate with it, and the more people seek help for it. We must destigmatize and decriminalize suicide. We are in Ghana where we have laws against suicide. We have a law that is against suicide attempt. If you kill yourself or if you attempt to kill yourself and you don't die, the law will deal with you. If you do this, what invariably you are doing is that we are rather going towards to reinforcement to rather use little means towards to kill themselves. Because if they try and they don't want to succeed, we will further, you know, uh, 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 penalize them. So we need to also look at the law and then decriminalize. Good news is that we are making an effort on that regard. Then again, responsible media reportage. The way the media also reports you said appears sometimes to, you know, also give rise to, you know, to that. We have run sens 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 sensitization programs for media men on how best to order to report suicide. WHO has come up with its own guidelines for media reportage. Yet, because of commercial reasons, a lot of media men are just not what, abiding by that. And it's not helpful. Then, of course, we must also restrict access to means. When a man is going through challenges and a man is having a gun at home, when a man is going through some challenges and a man is having a knife close by, we need to what, try to what, uh, make sure that they don't get access to some of these things. When a man is having a poison stuck somewhere in the house, when he's going through some challenges, we need to also identify these and then please uh, make them inaccessible to them. And of course, I think as a nation that the BHO is also enjoining all of us to have a national suicide prevention plan. When we have that, then we could have, you know, a whole systematic way of approaching the issue of suicide and male suicide in particular. So concluding, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the male gender, that is such a cultural rather than the male sex poses the serious suicide risk in males. But let, let me also give this caution. There are true critical observations about suicide risk factors. The risk factors for suicide may vary between and within different sociocultural contexts and demographic groups. So you go to one context, what will make men kill themselves will be different from what will make men kill themselves in another context. And again, we have also found out that most people who display risk factors do not kill themselves. So we need to complement information on suicide risk factors in men with an understanding of how the sociocultural context within which men live shape how the risk factors play out in their lives and in the suicides. So typically, in Ghana, yes, loss of job may be a risk factor. Loss of job may not be a risk factor for suicide in other countries like Norway, where I lived, because the state will have a welfare scheme to cater for you. But in Ghana, loss of job means a lot. The meaning we, we put to loss of job and how we react to people who, when they lose their job, give a certain interpretation that makes them feel like they have lost it. Thus, life is not worth living. So we need to go beyond assessing information on suicide risk factors, you know, to an understanding of how each sociocultural context within which men live shape how these risk factors play out in their lifestyle and in suicides. Mr. Chairman, on this, I thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. That was great, huh? Man, man just to be a man is... Wahala. <laughs> Even before you're born. And why you're born? And then social culture, ahala. <laughs> and you can't be diagnosed, ahala. When you're diagnosed, you won't first for you, you know, for you, ahala. And yes, some people <laughs> want to be men. Ah, some new. Give me that man, ahala. <laughs> I thank you very much. Uh, uh, uh,
Okay. Thank you for such an insightful and then um, dedicated lecture. Um, yes, indeed, to be a man is not easy. Um, at this point, we'll open up for questions. So if you have any question, you can just um, raise up your hand, walk towards the mic and then ask your question, okay? Okay, I can see that Prof's hand is up. So please, um, the president of Accra College of Medicine, Professor Ifwahesi. Thank you very much. Doc. This was a really insightful opinion presentation. <laughs> well done. I mean, something we as pa pediatric surgeons have noticed um, in our practice that if we have uh, babies with, with congenital abnormality, if they are females, they do better. And if they are males, the males tend not to survive. That certainly corroborates what. Um, you have your studies have found so yes there's a risk factor that's why um, we we always tend to be happier if they are female than if they are male but as you say because gender is yeah. socialized mm -hmm. there is maybe there is so much more room for possible intervention um that we should find ways as a medical community of taking advantage of and of using every means. And I'm wondering, I haven't heard any contribution from the religious arm of our society. What do you think, what do you think the possibilities there are? Because there's so much people are taught when you're going into marriage, they say, if you're a woman, go and bring the wealth to us. If there's a debt, take it to, to the man. And everybody seems to accept it. Why? Well, we know that is not the fact, but we accept it. Why is there so much that we accept? And maybe that's part of the problem that we have at the moment. But thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Prof, for the uh, thought. Prof, um, religion, religion, we have found religion as, you know, have been a double edge. Okay, yes, we can use religion as a resource to promote health. But we have also found that religion also contributes to some of these negative, you know, uh, 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 masculine norms. You, are, you have people who cite the scripture and tell you that uh, the Bible says that females are weaker vessels and males are, you know, the stronger vessels. But Prof, you will agree with me that there's a world of difference between our physical, you know, life and our emotional life. So we can be physical, we can be aggressive, we can be strong, but it doesn't necessarily translate to, to stronger emotions. And so, and so we need to also work together with our religious groups uh -huh, for them to know that when they are interpreting the scripture, they need to do so within, uh, within a context, more or less, to encourage men to also admit their emotions. Because Christ, at some point, even what shared tears. We know that David fought many battles, but at some point, David cried, Oh Lord, have mercy upon me. So, the whole idea of man and men being invulnerable, it is a myth. It is a myth. And we need to counter that so that we don't continue to use religion as okay a medium to propagate this negativity. And so, Prof, we can still work with the religion, religious leaders, we can work with them to promote this uh, a, a, a very, very constructive, you know, uh, uh, masculinity, more or less, and health. So, thank you so much for the comment. Maybe it's something we need to work together uh -huh. and, 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 and push it so, so hard. So, Prof.
Thanks, and that's just. Hello, I hardly can hear. Um, yes. Is it better now, sir? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. I was saying data from the US and the West generally suggests um, that marriage is more beneficial for men than women in terms of life expectancy and health outcomes. So a single, a married man is supposed to be healthier and benefits more from marriage than even women benefit from marriage. Yet I find it surprising that in um, all the examples you cited for victims of suicide, they were all married men. So is suicide more common among single men in Ghana or married men? Like which um, which uh, portion of the population um, yeah. has more suicidal ideation and I guess suicidal okay. acts? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so so indeed, uh, research. I mean, uh, from both the Western and uh, and 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 the you know uh, the African societies will still uh, tell us that marriage is an important resource for mental health for men, especially. Marriage is a key resource for men. Okay, and so I mean, comparatively, um, there are more suicide suicide cases with single men than married men. However, when men are going through some particular challenges in marriage, the risk levels are elevated. For instance, the issue of infidelity, the issue of females who, you know, more or less uh, try disrespecting, I mean, in their, in their own terms, their males, uh, their, their husbands. We have also found issues of females who want to take, I mean, use uh, their ch the children more or less as a bargaining chip, okay, to want to, you know, uh, assert a certain right over their, 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 their husbands. And so marriage in itself, it is an important risk factor, but an uh, important uh, resource. However, there are certain peculiar problems in marriage, which actually elevates, you know, suicide for married men. And I think that is just across all countries. So far, so far, the data is concerned. Indeed. We have even found out that in the Muslim world, in the Muslim world, marriage is actually a, a serious risk factor for women than for men. A systematic review was done, and uh, in, in, in Muslim world, we found that marriage actually was is a risk factor for females more than for men. But apart from that, marriage generally is an important what important resource. However, like I said, infidelity, loss of job of a man, loss of job of a man loss of a job of a man in marriage also elevates the risk, you know. So so maybe that's how we may have to look at, at it. Therefore, we are saying that when people are married and some of these signs, you know, start emerging, where there's issue of infidelity, there's issue of what, loss of job, there's issue of uh, loss of custody of children or a uh, quarrel or conflict of a children custody. These are if some of the events that can elevate what suicidal risk in males who are in marriages. Okay, thank you very much. Um, please, if you joined online, you can type your question at the or in the chat session. Okay, it will be read on your behalf and answered accordingly. Also, I have a question from Dr. Banaman. She wants to know with all these socio cultural burdens placed on men, why do some society prefer male, male children to female children? <laughs> that's that that is another important so again we need to go back to our uh socialization again and then try to disabuse our minds of certain uh wrong uh, impression we have built so far i mean because we have seen the man as the lead the man as the, uh, the one in control so patricky patricky is what makes a lot of people want to have males and not females uh -huh. But the question is that if you want to then assert yourself as a leader, as the one in control, then obviously society will also expect you to provide, to do what you are supposed to do as a man. Are you with me? So, so the issue of patriarchy is still something that we, we, we are contending with. And we believe that, yes, 
Yes, I mean, you, you can also give rooms for women at some point to also lead, control certain areas of what, of life. It cannot be all about men. What about if you are not there? Wouldn't the woman be able to take care of the children? Can't also rely on what, on the females for some, some certain things? And indeed, we have stories of some females or some wives who have also supported their husband in so many ways. And so, uh, again, it is cultural. Why males will be preferred over females? It all depends on what the culture perceives as the importance of male and importance of female. But please, even in Ghana, there are some uh, societies that also what, place so much emphasis on females. For instance, for the Akans, if we're a female Akan and all your children are males, it also has its own connotations. And some females who are like that <laughs> also go through these stresses and they want to do everything it takes what, to be able to, to have females. Because to us, we feel the female line is what perpetuates our, you know, our, our lineage. And so it, it depends, you know, from one society to another society. It, it's all about the importance and the premium we place on male and female, depending on how we see how the society might be configured. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, any questions? Please, if you have a question, okay. We we'll take a question from Daniel. Uh, hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, my question. Thank you for a very um, insightful lecture. But my question is, do you think that this problem is solvable? Because, <laughs> no, I, it sounds, I, I may sound sarcastic. It's not, it's not sarcastic at all. Because no. <laughs> what, what you've described is a cultural problem. And mm. while, it's, while it is nice to think that the culture will change, I don't foresee that happening. So my question is, do you think that the problem of like male emotional needs not being met because society values what they do do you think it's solvable all right so all my right. simple so answer my as a community psychologist who places so much premium on prevention is that yes we can and it must start from our socialization you and i know very well that even before a child is born we want to go for certain colors of items we want to buy for the child so for a female we go for what pink colors. For males, we go for blue colors. So we start that gender, you know, uh, 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 division right from even when the child is born. When the child is also born and the child is growing up, we buy toy guns for the boy. Okay, and we buy dolls for the girl. But. Who told you that the girl is actually going up to become uh, 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 whatever? Uh, you know, there are girls who can also find themselves in male dominated. So, so for me, I keep on encouraging that. Let us be gender neutral in our socialization of children. For the issue of sex, the sexual fact cannot be contested. You are a female, you are a male. We have nothing to do about it. But the issue of gender, what society should say about male and female, I think that we should be neutral in, our, in the way we socialize, you know, our children. And indeed, we have, I think that we have made some gains as a nation. There used to be a time where males or females were not being taken to school. And then government actually came up with a whole policy that we should have gender mainstreaming. We should have, you know, girl-child education programs. And there, there, there were serious attempts, you know, through advertisement, you know, through advocacy to try to change or reverse the trend. And now, I'm a lecturer here at the University of Ghana, and I can tell you that for most of the courses in humanities, the females are dominating. And the, the females are doing very well. In fact, when you go to the scientists, in fact, I have some of my colleagues who are, who are here, they can testify to that. You, if we go into the, 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 the sciences, there are a lot more females who are also what, you know, coming in and who are also doing very well. So I think that we can, but we need to make that conscious effort to ensure that all our social institutions, our schools, our church, our media, we don't continue to, to you know, uh, you know, push this agenda of male being different, female being different when it comes to certain, you know, tasks and certain rules in society. 
A female can also marry a man and then take care of a man. That's a possibility. And there are females who are doing that. Okay, so 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 I think we can we can make progress, but we need to start from somewhere. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank, you. thank you. The guys should be asking questions, please. Any questions? Also, um, a link to an um, evaluation form has been put at a chat session. So please, um, you can check that out and then um, fill an evaluation form for us. Um, your comments are greatly appreciated. Um, please, any more questions? Okay, so I have one question from um, Dr. Banama. Please, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. So, where do the transgender fall in this discussion? Um, <laughs> let, let, let me say that this is a very, 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 uh, uh, <laughs> this question is so big for me. Uh, the reason is something I have not averted my attention, you know, through my research and then practice in the area. So let, 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 let me humbly uh, refrain to comment on that because I don't have the facts and I don't have the information to share on that. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, yeah. Some of the students didn't hear the question well. So I'll repeat. Where do the transgender fall in this discussion? So you can just think about it. And also yes. another question you, from Tony. What is the society and other relevant institutions doing to assist and orient the male forms on the dangers of all those factors responsible for high rates of suicide amongst men. Okay, okay. Yes, so I know that, uh, that, that, that there are some societies, for instance, in my church, in my church, for instance, we have what we have, found, we have called psychosocial health units, where we go to the men's fellowship, and then we run some programs for them. We actually educate them, sensitize them on certain matters. For instance, the issue of prostate cancer. Just last week, I organized a talk in my church on prostate cancer. And you will be shocked to know that a lot more men are having the symptoms of prostate cancer, yet they have never taken a step. Okay, so the, 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 the church, the society, the media, we all can play a role. But like I keep on saying, it must start from the very basic. Don't, we don't need to let our children, our, our boys watch television when the girls are in the kitchen and then washing the dishes. Let the children, uh, let the boys also go to the, the kitchen. The boys should not eat and then expect your, uh, your girl child to come and take the plate and go and wash it. It must start from home. So we need to make that conscious effort because at the end, remember, you are also going to what? To give your boy to somebody as well, a husband. And if you don't allow him or to, 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 to learn some of these things, he may go into a marriage and then he would want to be saved. So I think that we need to all make that conscious about that. No, we have come a long way. There are some positive you know, things about our culture, but at some point too, we need to also I mean, have a, a, an introspection and ask us, ourselves, what are some aspects of our culture and our socialization that have been very toxic as far as you know, our growth and development is concerned. So let us start from somewhere and make sure that we raise our children, both boys and girls, more or less, you know, in the same way, and not give preference to one over the other. Thank you very much. Also, um, I have a question for Marian, quite a long one. Um, if men in marriages have higher tendencies of committing suicide, then wives, being their main source of contact, can certainly play a huge role in preventing their suicidal tendencies as they are more likely to spot some of these symptoms. In addition to help that medical professionals can provide what are some of the keys that the wives can do to prevent these suicidal tendencies. 
Very what good. form of approach from wives help in dealing with these issues in men? Okay. This is, this is, I think, a very, very important question and a contribution at the same time. Yeah, so, so, so that is one of, one of the pillar, one of the pillars in, in what you're discussing. So wives can also play a very key role as far as men's health is concerned. They know the men more than, I mean, anyone else. They are with the men, they, I mean, share the same bed with the men and therefore they can see certain signs. That may all require some you know, professional help. Okay, so generally with health, I think that females can more or less be, be uh, 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 allies, okay, as far as their men's health is concerned. By allies, what we mean is that you can observe your man very well, you may know how he goes about things, you may notice certain changes easily, and you can what? You can encourage. Men want to be encouraged. You can encourage the men, uh -huh. but if you go like, ah, but you know, why are you sitting now? Why are you sitting now? Are you not going to see the doctor? You know, they, if you do that, if you turn them, if you reach them this way, they rather close up and not even go after. So we need to what? Let our women first of all be very attentive, you know, see all the signs and encourage the men, okay, to go. Sometimes they can even make the necessary or appointments and then consultations and then just ask the men to go with them. But when it comes to suicide, yes, men and females can also play a key role because at the end, they bear the brunt of the consequence of suicide. When a man leaves, he leaves the uh, whole children and the family only on the woman. So when women are also able to spot some signs of suicide, then of course they can also what, reach out for some professional help for their men. One, when you see a man suddenly what, withdrawing from things that usually he engages in, it could be a sign. It could be a sign. When you see your man, uh, sometimes, uh, he, I mean, he's not drinking and he has no, I mean, he doesn't drink. Suddenly he starts, you know, drinking. If he was even drinking uh, previously, maybe he was drinking for social reasons. But this time you see that your man consciously making an effort to, to drink at any least opportunity whenever he finds himself in distress. It could be a sign. When you see your man suddenly saying certain things, you know, I'm, I'm, life is not worth living. I'm tired. I don't think that I'm even important in this life. Whenever you hear this comment, please, again, you need to also take a step. In fact, just some, just uh, two year, two months ago, me, uh, somebody that I knew took his life. And the wife told me that the man started what? Um, uh, threatening that he would do it, he would do it. What did the woman do? The woman was so afraid, so what she did was to go and report the man to the police. That my husband is threatening to kill himself. My brother, the police came in, talked to the man, and just for the fact that the woman has just gone to the police and the police had come in and they have warned him that the next time when he does that, they will arrest him. Three days after the man actually took his life. So, for instance, I, I felt so bad because personally I knew them, and if the woman had told me about this, maybe there's a way I could have also what, helped. Uh, so, so, so we also need to uh, to find the right approach in getting the help whenever we see those signs from a man. Sometimes when we see a man, I mean, sharing their valued property, this man that I talked to you about, he called his daughter from the embassy of Ghana to come home. When the doctor came home, he gave the doctor the land document. He has put up a building. He gave the daughter a land document and then called the son who was also a tech to come home. When he came home, he also gave the son some kente clothes, some clothing that the man had. This for me were all signs. There were obvious signs that the man was really up to something. But the question is that what step did the man take? So this forum for me is an opportunity. We have to keep on sensitizing the public that these signs are there. For most suicide, there are signs. And there are quite a lot of signs, you know, that we may spot. If you know our husband very well and we see certain things that are not really going well or that, that are very atypical of them, we can take a step. Right. So there are quite a number of sites on a number of sales, and we can always find a few. I've just mentioned a few, but there are quite a lot that we can also spot. Thank you very much. Um, um please. Okay. So IT officer, they want um, the evaluation form reposted. So you can just repost it. Okay. 
Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay. So in the absence of any questions or comments, uh, I want to ask if um, the president, vice president, any additional comments um, before we close? Well, I, I want to thank you all for coming. And most important, I want to thank you, Johnny. Oh, thank you, bro. Excellent presentation and education. To be a man, Mahala. <laughs> Maybe it's a next lady. Be shown in a grass somewhere. But you have you have really liked us, and uh, we are most grateful. So, thank you, bro. And uh, we're going home. Speaking on behalf of the students. Oh, doing that. Uh, in our in our consultation, our work, our bear in mind that men, losing men, men said when you go to the OPD, there are men, more women at the OPD than men. When you come to the wars, there are more men than men. It's because men only come. If a men are dragged into the hospital when they cannot <laughs> exert their usual manchu, manchu, uh, authority. And so, if you bear that in mind, everything is to you and relating to uh, our patients. Uh, yes, we are equal, but uh, gender issues uh, has a great bearing on us. So, on behalf of the Say thank you. Jenny, on behalf of Accra for your mercy. Thank you, thank you all. And God bless you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Prof. And thank you for the opportunity. All right. Bye bye. 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 Um, our Father in heaven, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together and learn. We thank you for all the knowledge that we've gained today, and we ask for the grace to apply it in our daily lives. We ask you to help and strengthen every man here. You help and strengthen every woman to be a supportive woman, whether sister, wife, sibling, or cousin to an email. Give them the grace to be able to support them, even in times of emotional needs. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. all right. for Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>